Good evening, everybody. I'm John O'Loughlin. Welcome to my channel. It's called McDuff Lives 2. And uh, this is our backup channel, but I'm going to stick with it for a little while. We, we've got 855 subscribers as of my last look this afternoon. And I'm going to keep on going. I, I want to build up at least to 1,000 over here on the backup channel. We have uh, over 7,000 at the main channel, McDuff Lives. But we're still working off a couple of strikes, and I'm a little concerned about doing anything over there until uh, a little more time passes by. So thanks for uh, letting everybody know that we are definitely on the backup channel for the rest of this week and probably for uh, a couple more weeks after that. Uh, definitely want to have the flexibility of going back and forth in case they hit me here, I can pop up over there. And, and that, of course, is the idea behind Screaming Ospreys TV, which I know a lot of folks have checked out. All you got to do is go over to ScreamingOspreys.com and, and you'll see the, uh, the, the uh, TV screen up after you scroll down about, one, about the width of one screen. You'll scroll down and then you'll see the TV screen. And there you go. You can expand it to full size and you can uh, tap to unmute it. And whatever show is playing at that time, that's what will that, that will uh, be available to you. Right now, I'm on uh, Screaming Ospreys TV as a kind of a simulcast, just to uh, make that available. And but uh, you know, the best place to see the show is right here on McDuff Lives Two. The Screaming Ospreys TV is going to be good for uh, reviewing things uh, for my book readings. And for me to uh, put things up that come from other channels, such as uh, great Mark Kulak's channel, uh, who's Satanic Live, who has now uh, uh, opened his uh, his archives to me. So we'll be sharing his work there as well. Um, there you go. You can see how that works. There's my book. Um, obviously, my book is also right here behind me on the shelf. And they are uh, available in paperback as well as Kindle over at Amazon. That's the only place to get them right now. Um, we're hoping that Neighborhood News Studio, when they uh, catch up with all the orders they have for the George Webb books, will be able to produce some of my uh, books as well. And we'll try to do a deluxe edition for release up there in, uh, in the studio in Temperance, Michigan. Uh, that, uh, of course, we'll have to uh, do it when we can. But yeah, hello for everybody. Hello for round two, says David Underdown. And yeah, I'm, I'm doing two shows today. The first two years of my show, I did two shows a day, just about every day, because I was so pumped up to get this information out. And then uh, here I am now, I've just recovered from uh, writing the book, and that took a lot of my time. Uh, now, of course, we had a little health crisis here a couple of weeks ago, which is still uh, taking up a lot of my time to make sure we take the very best care of our beloved drummer, who is upstairs uh, 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 resting. She went back to work today for a day, but uh, she, I think she, she thinks the better of it. She was pretty exhausted by the time of tonight. Anyway, but she's fine. She's just got to take it easy, that's all. Excuse me a second. Hey, Tyrone Sargent, how you doing? The, the old minefields, yeah, I've, I've still got them, you know, but I, it takes, it's just a very tedious and time-consuming process to, to go back and find them and then reload them up onto YouTube. So I don't know when I'll do that. Uh, I do have them, and I, but I know other people have, uh, there's a person named Blackberry Club that is good enough to record a lot of my stuff and put it up on what does he put it on? I can't remember. One of the backups, either BitChute or Odyssey or I don't know. I, I get him confused. Mm. 
Michael Laura, it's always fun to have you here, Michael. And uh, you're you're a very erudite person. I I wonder if you wouldn't want to be a guest on the show one night. Um, not to put you on the spot, but I think you've got a lot to offer if you if you would like to do that. Um, let me know. Tomorrow night I have uh, Bill Taylor back, and that'll be exciting. He's a great writer and thinker and has been uh, helping us sort out all of the denizens of Gibson Island for the past two or three years now. So that'll be good tomorrow night. And tonight we're going to move on to our topic for the evening, which it, I've been looking forward to this really for a couple of years to share with you um, some readings and my own comments on the book called The Ruler, Rulers of Evil by Tupper Saucy. And I'm going to go and get my copy of that up so I can uh, start reading with you. Uh, Rulers of Evil by Tupper Saucy. The full title is Use, Rulers of Evil, Useful Knowledge About Governing Bodies. And, uh, you know, Andy, if you can get a, a copy of the cover up there. Well, I can do this. Let me do it. There, you can see that now, right? So, Rulers of Evil, Useful Knowledge About Governing Bodies, and look at the illustration that you have there. Uh, you may recognize this illustration. I uh, see the, the lady there with a sword, uh, stars on her helmet, and a, and a bird, looks like an eagle on top of that, holding a shield made of the uh, red, white, and blue. A big eagle below her, holding a, a, uh, a bundle of arrows in its talons. The people down below look like they're kind of afraid and also kind of uh, scurrilous and not good people. So they are being vanquished with the sword of the lady in the picture. Useful knowledge about governing bodies. So I'm going to skip a lot of the introductory stuff um, and the uh, the little biography of about ten pages. That's really worth reading. If you guys, you know, you can get this online. It's free. And the introduction tells you about Tupper Saucy and his life and his uh, writing, uh, his other writings, A Miracle on Main Street and uh, Tennessee Waltz, this, this fascinating story I haven't read about James Earl Ray and how he was set up by the system. And uh, because they were, uh, he, he, Saucy apparently knew this guy um, James Earl Ray, well enough to uh, to to do a biography, and you know Saucy's a, is a courageous writer. So I want to go ahead and start reading in the first actual chapter of the book called Subliminal Rome, and we're going to be uh, heading back in time a pretty good ways shortly. But we start we begin in 1992 with a Time Magazine cover, when a Pulitzer Prize winning reporter announced in his 1992 Time Magazine cover story that a conspiracy binding President Ronald Reagan and Pope John Paul II into a quote, secret holy alliance had brought about the demise of communism. At least one reader th saw through the hype. Professor, Professor Carol A. Brown at the University of Massachusetts fired off a letter to Times editor saying, quote, last week I taught my students about the separation of church and state. 
This week, I learned that the Pope is running U.S. foreign policy. No wonder our young people are cynical about American ideals. What Brown had learned from Carl Bernstein, that's Carl Bernstein of the Watergate writer, I had discovered for myself over several years of private investigation. The papacy really does run United States foreign policy and always has. Yes, Bernstein noted that the leading American players behind the Reagan-Vatican conspiracy to a man were, quote, devout Roman Catholics, namely William Casey, the director of the CIA, Alexander Haig, the secretary of state, Richard Allen, the national security advisor, Vernon Walters, the ambassador at large, Judge William Clark, the national security advisor, and William Wilson, the ambassador to the Vatican State. But the reporter ne neglected to mention that the entire Senate Foreign Relations Committee was governed by Roman Catholics as well, specifically Senators Joe Biden, John Kerry, Paul Sarbanes, Daniel Moynihan, and Christopher Dodd. Bernstein would have been wandering off point to list the Roman Catholic leaders of American domestic policy, such as Senate Majority Leader George Mitchell and Speaker of the House Tom Foley. In fact, when the Holy Alliance story hit the stands, there was virtually no arena of federal legislative activity, according to the 1992 World Almanac of U.S. Politics, that was not directly controlled by a Roman Catholic senator or representative. The committees and subcommittees of the United States Senate and House of Representatives governing commerce, communications and telecommunications, energy, medicine, health, education and welfare, human services, consumer protection, finance and financial institutions, transportation, labor and unemployment, hazardous materials, taxation, bank regulation, currency and monetary policy, oversight of the Federal Reserve, commodity prices, rents services, small business administration, urban affairs, European affairs, Near Eastern and South Asian affairs, terrorism, narcotics, international communications, international economic, trade, oceans, and environmental policy, insurance, housing, community development, federal loan guarantees, economic stabilization measures, including wage and price controls, gold and precious metals transactions, agriculture, animal and forestry products, rural issues, nutrition, price supports, food for peace, agricultural exports, soil conservation, irrigation, stream channelization, flood control, minority enterprise, environment and pollution, appropriations, defense, foreign operations, vaccines, drug labeling and back packaging, drug and alcohol abuse, inspection and certification of fish and processed food, use of vitamins and saccharin, national health insurance proposals, human services, legal services, family relations, the arts and humanities, the handicapped and aging. In other words, virtually every aspect of secular life in America came under the chairmanship of one of these Roman Catholic laypersons. And now here's the list. Frank Annunzio, Joseph Biden, Silvio Conte, Kika de la Garza, John Dingle, Christopher Dodd, Vic Fazio, James Florio, Henry Gonzalez, Thomas Harkin, Edward Kennedy, John Kerry, John LaFalse, Patrick Leahy, Charles Lucan, Edward Madigan, Edward Markey, Joseph McDade, Barbara Mikulski, George Miller, Daniel Moynihan, John Murtha, Mary Rose Okar, David Obey, Claiborne Pell, Charles Rangel, Dan Rostenkowski, or Edward Roy Bow. Vatican Council IP's Constitution on the Church, 1964, instructs politicians to use their secular offices to advance the cause of Roman Catholicism. Catholic laypersons, quote, whoever they are, are called upon to expand, expend all their energy 
for the growth of the church and its continuous sanctification. And, quote, to make the church present and operative in those places and circumstances where only through them can it be become the salt of the earth, end quote. Vatican II further instructs all Catholics, quote, by their competence in secular disciplines and by their activity to vigorously contribute their efforts so that the goods of this world may be more equitably distributed among all men and may in their own way be conducive to universal progress in human and Christian freedom and to remedy the customs and conditions of the world if they are an inducement to sin so that they all may conform to the norms of justice and may favor the practice of virtue rather than hinder it, unquote. Vatican II affirms Catholic doctrine dating back to 1302, when Pope Boniface VIII asserted that, quote, it is absolutely necessary for the salvation of every human creature to be subject to the Roman pontiff, unquote. This was the inspiration for the papacy to create the United States of America that materialized in 1776 by a process just as secret as the Reagan-Vatican production of Eastern Europe in 1989. What? American government, Roman Catholic, from the beginning? Pardon me a second. take a break from reading and I have to change uh, pages to see the chat but just wanted to see hello to everybody Christy's here um what's going on Okay, well, it's good to have you all here. Um, Debbie Zapina is here. Melissa is here. Zagonostra Nostra. That sounds suspicious. The Biomancer is here, and uh, the Mobster Full is here. Hello, Mobster. Brightmore, David, and uh, yeah. David says some Dulleses were Catholics, two others Calvinists. It's confusing. Well, think, think of it uh, in terms of what was the most useful thing for the clients of Sullivan and Cromwell at the time. Sometimes it was useful to have a Calvinist, and sometimes it was useful to have a Catholic. <laughs> and so, you know, you had uh, Alan, the Calvinist, and Avery, the Catholic. But one really has to question how in the world did Avery Dulles become a cardinal? Very, very suspicious to me. Norman's here. Norman Smith. Hey, man. Okay. Brightmore Di Dinosaur says, all connected by Freemasonry. Well, this is, this is part of what's so interesting about this book, okay? As, as most of you know, I'm a big fan of Dr. Sean Ross, H-R-O-S-S, or Sean Ross, whose uh, main channel is called Giure, G-I-U-R-E-H, -E on YouTube. And he is a, a great scholar of the movements that came all the way from Babylon and Egypt through Rome into uh, the, uh, the Knights Templar and then straight uh, from there to today. And he says that the two governing systems, the, the monarchical or the imperial system, which is a top-down system, the vertical rule, and the 
oligarchical rule, which is the horizontal rule, the, the rule, the republic, the, the republic of equals, the republic based on, only, of course, on the people who are either noble or, or landed, landed gentry. That oligarchical form and the monarchical form uh, made, uh, made peace. And both work together against the common people to exploit us and force us to pay their bills for them and fight their wars and, when necessary, uh, submit to being called, which is possibly going on right now. Yes, we see in Octagon. Yeah, he does fantastic work. I, I love to watch Sean Ross's videos. Okay, let's get back to the text. Consider the land known today as the District of Columbia bore the name Rome in 1663 property records. This is true. I've looked this up. And the branch of the Potomac River that bordered Rome on the south was called Tiber. Yes, and there is still is a little place called Tiber Creek. There's a there's a pub called the Tiber Creek Pub, which kind of run. It's kind of behind the Dubliner, off of uh, E Street near the Capitol, and that's where there used to be a little river called the Tiber, and it's it was covered over. This information was reported in the 1902 edition of the Catholic Encyclopedia's article on Daniel Carroll, the article specifically declaring itself of interest to Catholics in the 1902 edition was deleted from the New Catholic Encyclopedia of 1967. Other facts were reported in 1902 and deleted from 1967. For example, when Congress met in Washington for the first time, in November 1800, quote, the only two really comfortable and imposing houses within the bounds of the city, unquote, belonged to Roman Catholics. One was Washington's first mayor, Robert Brent. The other was Brent's brother-in-law, Notley Young, a Jesuit priest. Daniel Carroll was a Roman Catholic congressman from Maryland who signed two of America's fundamental documents, the Articles of Confederation and the United States Constitution. Carroll was a direct descendant of the Calverts, a Catholic family to whom King Charles I of England had granted Maryland as a feudal barony. Carroll had received his education at St. Omer, at St. Omer Jesuit College in Flanders, where young English-speaking Catholics were trained in a variety of guerrilla techniques for advancing the cause of Roman Catholicism among hostile Protestants. In 1790, President George Washington, a Protestant, appointed Congressman Daniel Carroll to head a commission of three men to select land for the federal city called for in the Constitution. Of all places, the commission chose Rome, which at the time consisted of four farms, all, one of which belonged to Daniel Carroll. It was upon Carroll's farm that the new government chose to erect its most important building, the Capitol. The American capital abounds with clues of its Roman origins. Freedom, the Roman goddess whose statue crowns the dome, was created in Rome at the studio of American sculptor Thomas Crawford. We find a whole pantheon of Roman deities in the great fresco covering the dome's interior rotunda. Persephone, Ceres, Freedom, Vulcan, Mercury, and even a deified George Washington. These figures were the creation of Vatican artist Constantino Brumidi. You've probably seen it. There's a picture of George Washington on the Capitol Dome, and he's got clouds all around him, and, and uh, it, it's, it's, it's an apotheosis, meaning that he was transformed into a god. The fact that the National State House evolved as a capital bespeaks Roman influence. No building can rightly be called a capital unless it's a temple of Jupiter, 
the great father god of Rome, who ruled heaven with his thunderbolts and nourished the earth with his fertilizing rains. If it was a Capitolium, it belonged to Jupiter and his priests. Jupiter's mascot was the eagle, which the founding fathers made their mascot as well. A Roman eagle tops the governing idol of the House of Representatives, a 46-inch sterling silver and ebony wand called a mace. The mace is, quote, the symbol of authority in the House. When the sergeant of arms displays it before an unruly member of Congress, the mace restores order. Its position at the rostrum tells whether the House is in committee or in session. America's national motto, Annuit Cheptis, came from a prayer to Jupiter. It appears in Book Nine of Virgil's epic propaganda, the Aeneid, a poem commissioned just before the birth of Christ by Gaius Massenus, the multi-billionaire power behind Augustus Caesar. The poem's objective was to fashion Rome into an imperial monarchy for which its citizens would gladly sacrifice their lives. Fascism may be an ugly word to many, but its stately emblem is apparently offensive to no one. The emblem of fascism, a pair of them, commands the wall among, above and beyond the speaker's rostrum in the chamber of the House of Representatives. They're called fascists, and I can think of no reason for them to be there other than to declare the fascistic nature of American Republic democracy. A fascist is a Roman device. Actually, it originated with the ancient Etruscans from whom the earliest Romans derived their religious jurisprudence nearly 3,000 years ago. It's an axe head whose handle is a bundle of rods tightly strapped together by a red sinew. It symbolizes the ordering of priestly functions into a single infallible sovereign, an autocrat who could require life and limb of his subjects. If the fascist is entwined with laurel, like the pair on the house wall, it signifies Caesarean military power. The Romans called this infallible sovereign Pontifex Maximus, supreme bridge builder. No Roman was called Pontifex Maximus until the title was given to Julius Caesar in 48 BC. Today's Pontifex Maximus is Pope John Paul II. As we shall discover in a forthcoming chapter, John Paul does not hold that title alone. He shares it with a mysterious partner, a military man, a man holding an office that has been known for more than four centuries as Papa Nero, the Black Pope. I shall present evidence that the House Fasces represents the Black Pope, who indeed rules the world. Later, I will develop what is sure to become a controversial hypothesis, that the black pope rules by divine appointment and for the ultimate good of mankind. Now, this is the fascinating part, is that Tupper Saucy, along with uh, Carol Quigley, and a number of of authors that I've read that I can't think of of who, but it seems to be a theme to me that after exposing the evil that goes on, they will wrap it up, put a bow on it at the end, and say, "Well, it's all for the good." And I don't like that. I wonder if he just, he didn't do that in order to kind of stay under the radar. Kind of like the way the end of, of the brothers by uh, Stephen Kinzer is where, you know, he's exposed all of this horrible corruption and self-dealing with the Dulles brothers. But uh, somehow he, he manages to, to bring it into the fold of who we really are as Americans and say, well, that's, you know, the Dulles brothers are who we are. And I disagree. I don't think the Dulles brothers are who we are at all. But to say something like that at the end of the book, to tie it all together and get it past the, the, the publishers, I guess, makes sense. 
Anyway, Tupper Saucy is a fantastic uh, uh, storyteller and historian of these things that nobody else really did this the the research until he did it. So I I accept you know his his uh, claim that good comes out of evil, but I mean I I accept that he says that. But I think that's a that's a conclusion that I can't reach. Few people seem to be aware that the Roman Catholic Church in America is officially recognized as a state. How this came to about makes interesting reading. In early in his administration, President Ronald Reagan invited the Vatican, whose ruling head is the Pope, to open its first embassy in Washington, D.C. His Holiness responded positively, and the embassy, or apostolic nunciature of the Holy See, opened in 1984. Shortly thereafter, a complaint was filed against President Reagan at U.S. District Court in Philadelphia by the American Jewish Con Congress, the Baptist Joint Committee on Public Affairs, Seventh-day Adventists, the National Council of Churches, the National Association of Evangelicals, and Americans United for Separation of Church and State. They sought to have the court declare that the administration had unconstitutionally granted the Roman Catholic faith privileges that were being denied to other establishments of religion. The suit was thrown out by Chief Judge Fulham. Judge Fulham ruled that the district courts did not have jurisdiction to intervene in, quote, foreign policy decisions. The apostolic nunciature at 339 Massachusetts Avenue Northwest enables Pontifex Maximus to supervise more closely the American civil government, that is, public policy, as administered through Roman Catholic laypersons. One such layperson was Chief Judge Fulham, whose Roman Catholicism apparently escaped the attention of the plaintiffs. This same imperium ran pagan Rome in essentially the same way. The public servants were priests of the various gods and goddesses, Monetary affairs, for example, were governed by priests of the goddess Moneta, priests of Dionysus, managed architecture and cemeteries, while priests of Justitia, with her sword, and Libera, blindfolded, holding her scales aloft, ruled the courts. Hundreds of priestly orders, known as the Sacred College, managed hundreds of government bureaus, from the justice system to the construction, cleaning, and repair of bridges. No bridge could be built without the approval of Pontifex Maximus. Buildings, temples, castles, baths, sewers, ports, highways, walls, and ramparts of cities and the boundaries of land. Priests directed the paving and repairing of streets, supervised the calendar and the education of youth. Priests regulated weights, measures, and the value of money. Priests solemnized and certified births, baptisms, puberty, purification, confession, adolescence, marriage, divorce, death, burial, excommunication, canonization, deification, adoption into families, adoption into tribes and orders of nobility. Priests ran the libraries, the museums, the consecrated lands and treasures. Priests registered the trademarks and symbols. Priests were in charge of public worship, directing the festivals, plays, entertainments, games, and ceremonies. Priests wrote and held custody over wills, testaments, and legal conveyances. By the 4th century, one half of the lands and one fourth of the population of the Roman Empire were owned by priests. When the Emperor Constantine and his Senate formally adopted Christianity as the empire's official religion, the exercise was more of a merger or acquisition than a revolution. The wealth of the priests merely became the intermediate, the immediate possession of the Christian churches, and the priests merely declared themselves Christians. Government continued without interruption. The pagan gods and goddesses were artfully outfitted with names appropriate to Christianity. The sign over the pantheon indicating, quote, to the fertility goddess Sibel and all the gods, unquote, was rewritten, quote, to Mary and all the saints. The Temple of Apollo became the Church of St. Apollinaris. 
the Temple of Mars was reconcentrated, Church of Santa Martina, with the inscription, Mars, hence ejected, Martina, martyred maid, claims now the worship which to him was paid. Hallowed icons of Apollo were identified as Jesus, and the crosses of Bacchus and Tammuz were accepted as the official symbol of the crucifixion. Pope Leo I decreed that, quote, the St. Peter and St. Paul have replaced Romulus and Remus as Rome's protecting patron, patrons. Pagan feasts, too, were Christianized. December 25th, the celebrated birthday of a number of gods, among them Saturn, Jupiter, Tammuz, Bacchus, Osiris, and Mithras, were claimed to have been that of Jesus as well and the traditional Saturnalia, season of drunken merriment and gift-giving, evolved into Christmas. Bacchus was popular in ancient France, under his Greek name Dionysus, or as the French rendered it, Denis, Denis. His feast, the Festern Dionysi, was held every seventh day of October, at the end of the vintage season. After two days of wild partying, another feast was held, the Festum Dionysi Eleutheriae Rusticum, that is the country festival of Mary Dionysus. The papacy cleverly brought the worshippers of Dionysus into its jurisdiction by transforming the words Dionysus, Bacchus, Eleutheriae, and Rusticum into a group of Christian martyrs. October the 7th was entered on the liturgical calendar as the feast day of St. Bacchus the Martyr, while October 9th was instituted as the festival of St. Denis and of his companions, St. Eleuthera and St. Rustic. The Catholic Almanac of 1992 sustains this fabrication by designated October 9th as the feast day of Denis Bishop of Paris, and two companions identified by early writers as Rusticus, a priest, and Eleutherius, a deacon martyred near Paris. Denis is popularly regarded as the apostle and patron, patron saint of France. Playing loose with the truth and scripture in order to bring every human creature into subjection to the Roman pontiff is a technique called missionary adaptation. This is explained as the adjustment of the mission subject to the cultural requirements of the mission object, so that the papacy's needs will be brought, quote, as much as possible in accord with the existing social shared patterns. Evaluation and thought of action, thought, evaluation and action, so as to avoid unnecessary and serious disorganization. Rome has so seamlessly adapted its mission to American secularism that we do not think of the United States as a Catholic system. Yet, the rosters of government rather decisively show this to be the case. By far the greatest challenge to missionary adaptation has been scripture, that is, the Old and New Testaments, commonly known as the Holy Bible. Almost for as long as Rome has been the seat of Pontifex Maximus, there has been a curious enmity between the popes and the Bible, whose believers they are presumed to head. In the next chapter, we shall begin our examination of that enmity. Every ruled society has some form of Holy Scripture. The Holy Scriptures of Caesarean Rome were the prophecies and ritual directions contained in the ten Sibylline Gospels and Virgil's Aeneid. The Aeneid implied that every Roman's duty was to sacrifice his individuality, as heroic Aeneas had done, to the greater glory of Rome and Pontifex Maximus. The Sibyllines, that is S-I-B-Y-L-L-I-N-E-S, borrowing from Isaiah's much earlier prophecy of Jesus Christ, prophesied that when Caesar Augustus succeeded his uncle Julius as Pontifex Maximus, he would rule the world as, quote, Prince of Peace, Son of God, unquote. Augustus would issue in a new world order, as indeed he did. The Sibyllines and the Aeneid were so beloved by the government priests that they were considered part of the Roman Constitution. The same scriptures were made part of the United States Constitution when the mottos 
annuit chapters, and novus ordo, ordo seclorum, taken from the Aeneid and the Sibyllines respectively, were incorporated by the act of July 28, 1782, into the great seal of the United States. The Sibyllines and the Aeneid were open only to priests and to certain privileged persons. The people learned their sacred content by the trickle-down of priestly retelling. When the Old and New Testaments were adopted as the Empire's official sacred writings, they too were given to the exclusive care of the priests. And in accordance with Roman tradition, the people learned sacred content from discretionary retelling. This had to be for the sake of the Holy Empire, for should the people acquire biblical knowledge, they would know that Pontifex Maximus was not a legitimate Christian entitlement. Knowing this, they would not bow to his supremacy. The empire could collapse. And so the monarchical Roman church forcibly suppressed the Bible's intelligent reading. This is why the millennium be between Constantine and Gutenberg is known as the Dark Ages. Sprinkled throughout the empire, however, were isolated Christian assemblies who had preserved scripture from the days of the early church. For them, the Bible invited an ongoing personal communion with the creator of the universe. They lived by the writings of which Rome was so jealous. By the 13th century, they, these assemblies had grown so vibrant that Pope Gregory IX declared unauthorized Bible study as heresy. He further decreed that it is the duty of every Catholic to persecute heretics. To manage the persecution, Gregory established the Pontifical Inquisition. The Inquisition treated the slightest departure from the life of the community as proof of direct communication with the Bible or Satan. Either instance was a sin worthy of death. Cases were prosecuted according to a strict routine. First, the inquisitors would enter a town and present their credentials to the civil authorities. In the Pope's name, they would require the governor's cooperation. Next, the local priest would be ordered to summon his congregation to hear the inquisitors preach against heresy, which was defined as anything the least bit opposed to the papal system. A brief grace period followed the sermon wherein the people were given an opportunity to step forward and accuse themselves of crimes. Those who did were usually punished mildly. Later, the inquisitors would re receive at their lodgings unverified accusations, guaranteeing in the Pope's name the anonymity of informants. Many innocent lives were ruined by false testimony. Trials were conducted arbitrarily and secretly by tribunals consisting of the inquisitors, their staffs, and their witnesses, all concealed under hoods. The accused were never told the charges against them, and they were forbidden to ask. No defense witnesses were permitted, the accused had but one option, to confess guilt and die. Those who refused to confess, and witnesses who balked at testifying, were carried to the dungeon for torture sessions. Boys under 14 and girls under 12 were accepted. Inquisitors and executioners were commanded by papal edicts to show no mercy. No acquittal was ever recorded. Every fully prosecuted case ended in the death of the defendant and the forfeiture of his or her property, since it was assumed, as in American forfeiture cases since 1984, that the property was gained in sin. Sometimes the property of family members for generations to come was forfeited. These forfeitures were paid out in expenses to the scribes and executioners, half of the remainder going into the papal treasury and half to the inquisitors. Although popes and inquisitors amassed great fortunes from the Inquisition, its greatest beneficiary was and has been the Roman system. The Inquisition was most effective against the isolated truth seeker in an ignorant community. As communities became more literate, the Inquisition grew subtler. What brought literacy to communities was the epidemic of Bible reading made possible by the perfection of Johannes Gutenberg's invention of movable type. Gutenberg chose the Bible to demonstrate movable type, not so much that the common man might be brought nearer to God, 
but that he and his backer, Dr. Johannes Faust, might make a killing in the book trade. Prior to 1450, Bibles were so rare they were conveyed by deed, like parcels of real estate. A Bible took nearly a year to make, commanding a price equal to ten times the annual income of a prosperous man. Johannes Gutenberg intended his first production, a folio edition of the 6th century Latin Bible known as the Vulgate, to fetch manuscript prices. Dr. Faust discreetly sold it as a -a one-of-a-kind to kings, nobles, and churches. A second edition in 1462 sold for as much as 600 crowns each in Paris, but sales were too sluggish to suit Faust, so he slashed prices to 60 crowns and then to 30. This put enough copies into circulation for church authorities to notice that several were identical. Such extraordinary uniformity being regarded as humanly impossible, the authorities charged that Faust had produced the Bibles by magic. On this pretext, the Archbishop of Mainz had Gutenberg's shop raided and a fortune in counterfeit Bibles seized. The red ink with which they were embellished was alleged to be human blood. Faust was arrested for conspiring with Satan, but there is no record of any trial. Meanwhile, the pressmen, who had been sworn not to disclose Gutenberg's secrets while in his service, fled the jurisdiction of Mainz and set up shops of their own. As paper manufacture improved, along with the technical improvements in matrix cutting and typecasting, books began to proliferate. Most were editions of the Vulgate. In the decade following the Mainz raid, five Latin and two German Bibles were published. Translators busied themselves in other countries. An Italian version appeared in 1471, Bohemian in 1475, Dutch and French in 1477, and Spanish in 1478. As quickly as our generation has become computer literate, the Gutenberg generation learned to read books, and careful readers found shocking discrepancies between the papacy's interpretation of God's word and the word itself. In 1485, the Archbishop of Mainz issued an edict punishing unauthorized Bible reading, with excommunication, confiscation of books, and heavy fines. The great Renaissance theologian Desiderius Erasmus challenged the Archbishop by publishing in 1516 the first printed edition of the Greek New Testament. He addressed the anti-Bible mentality in his preface with these words, I vehemently dissent from those who would not have private persons read the Holy Scriptures, nor have them translated into the vulgar tongues, as though either Christ taught such difficult doctrines that they can only be understood by a few theologians, or the safety of the Christian religion lay in ignorance of it. I should like all women to read the Gospel and the Epistles of Paul. Would that they were all translated into all languages, so that not only the Scotch and Irish, but Turks and Saracens might be able to read and know them. A Catholic monk named Martin Luther, against the advice of his superiors, plunged into the New Testament of Erasmus. He was shocked by the absence of scriptural authority for so many church traditions. Of the seven church sacraments, only two, baptism and the Lord's Supper, were grounded in scripture. The remaining five, Confirmation, absolution, ordination, marriage, and extreme unction were the inventions of post-biblical councils and decrees. Luther found no scriptural mandate for celibacy of monks and nuns, or for pilgrimages and the veneration of sacred relics. The church taught that prayer, good works, and regular participation in the sacraments might save man from eternal damnation. Luther found this to be opposed to the teaching of scripture. According to scripture, only one thing can save man from the consequences of his sins, God's grace, and that alone. The most explosive result of Luther's Bible reading was its attitude toward the papacy. Nowhere in scripture could the passionate monk find that God had ordained an imperious Roman vicar of Christ to rule over a vast economy based on selling rights to do evil. These rights were called indulgences. They had been a church tradition since Pope Leo III had begun granting them in the year 800. 
payable in the money coined by Pope Adrian I in 780. Indulgences were floated on the church's credibility, rather like government bonds are issued on the credibility of states today. In 1491, for example, Innocent VII granted the 20-year Butterbriefe indulgence by which Germans could pay 20, a 20th of a guilder for the annual privilege of eating dairy products, even while meriting from fasting. The proceeds of the Butterbriefe were to build a bridge at Torgau. Rome's indulgence economy was as extensive as America's income tax system today, and it was every bit as fueled by the people's trembling compliance voluntarily to a presumption of liability. In 1515, Pope Leo X issued a bull, a bull of indulgence authorizing letters of safe conduct to paradise and pardons for evil, every evil imaginable, from a 25-cent purgatory release to a license so potent that it would excuse someone who had raped the Virgin Mary for the payment of four ducats. One could be forgiven, forgiven for murdering one's father. Sorcery was pardoned for six ducats. For robbing a church, the law could be relaxed for only nine ducats. Sodomy was pardoned for 12 ducats. Half the revenues from Leo's indulgence went to a fund for the building of St. Peter's Cathedral, the other half to paying 40% interest rates on bank loans, subsidizing the magnificent works of art and architecture with which His Holiness was establishing Rome as the cultural capital of the Renaissance. Historians have glorified Leo, whose father happened to be the great Florentine banker Lorenzo de' Medici, by marking the 16th century as the century of Leo X. In early 1521, Martin Luther formally protested the indulgence racket by nailing his famous 95 theses upon these indulgences to the door of the castle church of Wittenberg. The church was said to own a lock of the Holy Virgin's hair worth two million years of indulgences. Luther's theses exhorted Christians, quote, to follow Christ, their head, through penalties, deaths, and hells, rather than purchase, quote, a false assurance of peace from church indulgence salesmen. Leo had Luther arrested and detained for ten months in Wartburg Castle. While in custody, Luther managed to translate the Greek New Testament of Erasmus into German. Its publication alarmed the broadest reaches of Roman authority. Dobin, in his history of the Reformation, tells us that ignorant priests shuddered at the thought that every citizen, nay, every peasant, would now be able to dispute with them on the precepts of our Lord, unquote. Well, I'm at the bottom of page 22 of the text of Rulers of Evil, and I'm going to uh, stop there. Check in with what you guys are talking about. Bishop Lebron Abdul-Jabbar. Oh, well. <laughs> Did you get the jab? Jabbar says get the jab. All right. I get it. Um, but I'm not going to get it, if you know what I mean. Well, this is just the beginning of my indulgent my my investigation into rulers of evil a book i read maybe eight or nine years ago and now i have a new perspective on it which i think is going to help me to gain even more from it as i read it with you guys i'll be back with you uh tomorrow night at 8 p.m with the great bill taylor for another interesting discussion with him and uh, catch up with his research so We'll see you all tomorrow night at uh, 8 p.m. And thanks again for being with us. Uh, thanks for supporting me on Patreon. And do enjoy uh, the Screaming Ospreys TV show that I've set up over on 
ScreamingOspreys.com. Uh, it's there for you. And uh, if you are somebody that needs to stay up all night sometime, uh, we're there for you. Uh, just plug, turn it over to uh, Screaming Ospreys uh, TV and you'll have some programming all night long. All right. Good night, everybody. Thank you.